Miles Tillman, would you come up? <laughs> oh my goodness. How do you follow an introduction like that? Thank you, Kate. It's such a pleasure to be here with you all the way from Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia is hot, it's humid, the food is spicy. It's probably the most multi-ethnic, multicultural country on the planet. And um, our church says hello to all of you. And I can tell you, your leaders, Dan and Kate, uh, they are amazing people. I know you know that already, but uh, nearly nine years ago, they got on a plane with us to uh, leave this country to go to the other side of the planet to plant a church in the middle of KL and to set up this alpha hub for the region. And they are full of faith. They are full of integrity and they're great fun to be with. And you've done very well getting them as your leaders. So uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here. Yeah. Can you tell I'm quite excited to be here? Um, I want to talk to you today about revival. And I wonder what you think of when you hear that word. I'm, as you can probably tell, not originally from Malaysia. Uh, I, I was born in Manchester, another very wet place. And, um, and I grew up there. And uh, a few years ago, that really, really big, impressive club in Manchester, you know, Manchester City, um, they, um, they had this Brazilian striker called Gabriel Jesus. He now plays for some other small club. And um, his name is spelt Gabriel Jesus. And um, Man City had been doing really well. Then uh, Jesus got injured. Uh, and he was out for a while, and the, the club started to not do quite so well. And then Jesus, Gabriel Jesus, came back, and they started winning games again. And the local newspaper in Manchester, the Manchester Evening News, ran this headline, City Revival as Jesus Returns. <laughs> and... <laughs> I think the journalist had to put a statement out saying he wasn't insinuating that the second, second coming had happened in Salford. But um, what do you think of when you hear the word revival? We tend to associate it with a, uh, a significant, extraordinary move of God in a particular place or in a particular church or amongst a particular people, like the Great Awakening, the Hebridean revival or... Uh, the Welsh Revival, or whatever it may be. And all of that is true. And more recently, you may have been following a little bit of what happened in Asbury, uh, in Kentucky, in the US there. But today, I want to sort of, if we can, widen the definition a little bit and say it also refers to uh, a turnaround, a revival in circumstances, either at a national level, a city level, or just in your own life or that of your family? You know, do you long for, do you need a turnaround in your own life as well? Do you need revival? And our passage today is from the Old Testament, and it looks at about how God brings about such a turnaround and blessing for people. And the context of the passage is King Solomon of Israel has just finished building the temple. And this is around the 10th century BC. And the location of the temple is where the Dome of the Rock is today in Jerusalem. And God appears at night and speaks to King Solomon. So uh, let me read it to you. This is from 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 7, beginning at verse 11. I think the words will come up on the screen. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all that he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. 
When I shut up the heavens so that there's no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my, pe my people, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. Amen. Now, whilst we can't reduce the work of God to a formula, nor revival to a, a mechanistic process, it doesn't work like that. God does what he wants, when he wants, where he wants. We do, however, read three key words in this passage that shows how God often brings about a revival in our lives. And those words are when this is the situation. If God's people do this, then God often does that. When, if, then. And it all begins with the when of the situation. It says in the passage that when there is no rain, maybe you feel spiritually dry or like there's no blessings raining down on you right now. It says when there are locusts, maybe you feel that parts of your life are being stripped away, disappearing, eaten away at. Maybe your financial, relational, or spiritual well-being is just being laid bare. And it says when there is plague, perhaps you're here today, and, and if you're honest, it feels like just one thing after another after another has been hitting you, and it's overwhelming. Well, I want to really encourage you. Revival begins when. When we realize how desperate the situation is, and more importantly, when we realize how desperate we are, then God's people move towards the if. And we see that there are a number of steps that God often is looking for in our lives. And the first one from the passage we see is humility. Verse 14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. You know, when we're desperate, we become acutely aware of how relatively small we are compared with not just the challenges, but the size of our God. And we get a right perspective. And our posture really should be like that of John the Baptist in the New Testament. In John 3.30, he says of Jesus that Jesus, he must increase. I must decrease. And it's been said, hasn't it, that humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. And I don't know, don't know about you, but I've noticed that humble people often... Uh, like to lift others up rather than pull them down. They don't pull them down because they're not insecure. They know who they are in Christ. And this passage says, if my people who are called by my name, when you know that you're called by his name, you're secure in Christ, then you stop competing you know that you don't have to prove yourself. And it frees us up to be people that want to lift others up. We want to see others flourish because we have everything in Christ already. And, you know, Jesus modeled this perfectly. Philippians 2, verse 6. It's probably the oldest uh, part of the New Testament. It was the earliest liturgy in the early church. It says that we should have the same attitude of Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but became nothing. And taking on the very nature of a servant, he took human likeness and humbled himself 
and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Humility is what the Lord is looking for. I have uh, a friend called Steve. Steve's a pastor, and uh, to his amazement, he was once asked to go and speak at this massive conference. He still, to this day, doesn't know why they invited him. And uh, he turned up there, and there was this room for the speakers to get to know each other before the conference began. And he walked in, and he was like, oh, wow, look, I don't know anybody here. This is so intimidating. And in the corner, he saw this sort of granddad figure. So he thought, oh, I'll go and talk to him. So he went over and said, hi, I'm Steve. And the guy said, hi, I'm Bill. And they started chatting. And then they were brought into the auditorium for the start of this big conference. And they were put on the front row. And the host got up. And he said, tonight's first speaker is Heidi Baker of Iris Ministries in Mozambique. And Steve said he'd never heard of Heidi Baker. So he thought, I wonder who she is. So he gets his phone out and he starts Googling, who is Heidi Baker? And he turns to the woman next to him and says, oh, look, I'd never heard of her. She looks pretty impressive. She must be amazing, whoever she is. And the woman says, well, I'm sure she, she can't be that impressive. Then the host said, so will you welcome on stage Heidi Baker? At which point the woman stands up <laughs> and gets on, and he goes, oh, no. I've just told Heidi Baker I've got no clue who she is. <laughs> so she gets up, and she was absolutely amazing. And then afterwards, as she gets off the stage, Steve thinks, oh, I better make it up to her. So he runs up to Heidi and goes, I'm so sorry, I had no clue who you were. Uh, how can I make it up to you? Oh, let me introduce to you. And he saw the granddad figure coming over. This is my new friend. This is, and she goes, Bill, good to see you. And he goes, what, you know Bill? And she goes, yeah, I know Bill Johnson from Bethel Church. Um, we've just been singing his songs all night. And, and he goes, what, you're Bill? Oh, no, I've done it again. But Steve said to me, they were so nice. They were just so secure that they weren't in the least bit bothered, that he had no clue who they were. And, you know, that's what I've noticed about humble people. The key to humility is to look to Jesus rather than ourselves. He must increase. I must decrease. And I wonder, when you go either back to work or in your family or back at school on Tuesday, what could that look like for you? What could he must increase, I must decrease look like for you in your context? And, you know, it's a little bit like, um, you know, there's another passage in the Old Testament, 2 Kings 5, when the general Naaman is eventually healed of leprosy. But that amazing story begins with his servant girl, who tells him about the prophet Elisha, who we should go and see. And eventually he's healed through that encounter with Elisha. But what's interesting is it all starts with the servant girl saying, hey boss, why don't you go and see this guy? I know a guy. And nowhere in that scripture are we to told that girl's name. And see, the point is she had a voice, but not a name. And actually, I think that's true of the church at this moment in history. The Lord is calling us to be people with a voice, but without a name. And that's okay. I think that's how he likes it. And when we humble ourselves, then it moves us on to the next step, which is hunger. Hunger. When we realize our relative, relative powerlessness, we begin to realize of our desperate need for more of God. We begin to have this spiritual hunger for more of him in our situation. So that verse 14 continues. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. 
Do we pray and seek the Lord? Do we want to push into that intimate relationship with him? Yeah, at the start of the greatest sermon ever given, certainly not this one, it was the one that Jesus gave on the Sermon on the Mount. He says in the Beatitudes, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Righteousness means being in a right relationship with God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Yeah, it's important, not that we hunger for revival. You can make revival an idol. No, we hunger for the Lord. We worship him. Psalm 111 verse 2 says that the works of the Lord are great, sought out by all who delight in them. We seek out that which we delight in. Now in Malaysia, um, about 10% of the population is ethnically Indian. And the Indian food in Malaysia is extraordinary. And I'll be honest with you, what do I delight in? I delight in roti, Indian bread. And they've got all sorts of roti in, in Malaysia. Roti Chennai, uh, uh, roti tissue, roti tissue, yeah, it's actually called that. Uh, roti Jalan Mubarak. They've even got one called roti bomb because it's the bomb. And they just do this amazing bread. And I delight in roti. And I will actively seek out the best roti because I delight in it. Now, of course, Jesus did say, man shall not live on roti alone. But I take great heart in the fact that he also said of himself, I am the roti of life. You know, he's the only one in whom we can truly be satisfied and delight in. So as a church, let's hunger for more of the roti of life, for more of Christ. Now, you might, if you're being honest, be here right now and say, okay, Miles, but I'm not actually that spiritually hungry. Maybe you're here out of habit or duty or somebody's just brought you along. Well, I want to talk to you if that's you this morning. That's okay. Okay. Because you can pray to the Lord, to Jesus, and say, will you increase my hunger? Will you make me, Lord, please, more hungry? You know, somebody said to Jesus, I believe. Help my disbelief. In other words, my unbelief. In other words, help me believe more. You can say, I'm a little bit hungry. Can you make me more hungry for more of you? And if you ask, he'll do that. And that desire, that hunger for him can manifest itself in many ways in our lives. It could mean that you just play worship music more in your home or when you're in the car or if, I don't know, you do something very healthy like running or something like that. You might have worship on as you run. Or it might mean that you just have a desire to hunger, to read more of God's word. Or you just decide, that's it, I'm going to get up half an hour earlier in the morning and pray. I'm just going to pray and pray and pray. But another way in which an increased hunger in your life might manifest itself is a desire to let others know about this amazing bread of life that you have. A bit like, is it, is it Gabrielle? Yeah, you brought your mum along because you found something that tastes good and you love your mum and you want her to taste it too. And I, we often see that. You know, in our church, there's a woman, she's, um, she volunteers, she's often on the production desk at the back. She's called Sue Ai. Sue Ai works at a golf course. She used to uh, play on the women's professional tour. And now she's a coach. And she just was desperate as her hunger for Jesus grew. She was desperate for her colleagues 
at the golf course to know about Jesus. So she ran an alpha in her workplace for all of the staff there. And it was amazing. And then a guy who volunteers on our children's team, you know, he's in a T-shirt at the front each week doing the da 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 you know, this business. He heard about um, what Sue I was doing at the golf course, and he thought, oh, maybe I could run an alpha in my workplace, in my office. It's just down the road from the church. So he organized it, and he said to us, could you come in and help us week one? And... We turned up, I couldn't believe it. This guy, he's on our children's team. He's got 150 people on his alpha in his office. <laughs> it's extraordinary. And I, I thought, wow. I said, you did this? He goes, yeah, yeah, I just love the Lord. I want them to know it as well. So as you get hungry, you'll want other people to know. Yeah, bring them along this Wednesday or whenever it is. You see, here's the fact. When Christians get hungry, the world gets fed. And whoever you are, ask the Lord to make you hunger for more of him today. And just watch what happens in your life and the life of those around you. You see, when we combine humility with hunger, then something else starts to happen in our life, and that is holiness. Verse 14 continues, if my people who are called by my name, they know who, who, who they are in Christ, will humble themselves and get hungry and pray and seek my face. But the Lord continues in that verse, it says, and turn from their wicked ways. Repentance. You see, repentance doesn't just mean being sorry for the wrong that we've said, thought, or done. Well, it does, it does mean that, but it also means not just saying sorry, but an active turning away from it and an active turning towards the Lord. And when we have an increased realization of our sin and an increased realization of the beautiful purity of God, then it makes that turning just that little bit easier. And if you look at revival throughout history, every single, all, lots, revival's often different in different places, but they all have that one same thing in common a desire for holiness in their life. A turnaround in circumstances, a turnaround in your life and mine begins with a turning towards God and away from that which is wrong. So don't think of repentance as something to run from, but something to sprint towards. It's one of the most powerful, life-changing, destiny-defining things that we can do. And God's promise, of course, is that when we do that, we move from the when and the if to the then. It says, God says, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. We've just celebrated Easter recently. Easter is the biggest festival on the planet. More people celebrate Easter than anything else. And right at the heart of Easter is the cross of Christ. And the cross is always enough. Whatever we've done, thought, said, whatever we will do, think, or say, because of the cross, when we turn in repentance, we are always forgiven. God keeps no record of wrongs. The slate 
has been wiped clean. And that is very, very freeing. Righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, a right relationship with God. That's what you now have because of the Easter story, a fresh start. But what I also love about God's promise is not just, I will forgive them of their sins. It says, and will heal their land. I mean, think about that for a moment. When you're walking in this amazing city and you see things that aren't right, injustice, poverty, when you get betrayed or, or let down, or you just think, what, another pothole in the, in the road? When it's going wrong and you think, this is a mess, you and I, we're not powerless in that moment. We're not. Because we can, this promise of God says that we can impact what happens in our land through our own repentance. You see, a nation rises when the church drops to its knees. A city rises when the church drops in repentance. It's quite empowering, isn't it? My little act of repenting in the morning can impact my, me, my family, my city, my nation. Wow. God's actually given you quite an important job to do. And collectively, when we do it, he shapes the future. Just think what could happen in Brighton when we turn to him in repentance. What would a healed city look like? You know, Solomon, King Solomon, in whom God says this to in 2 Chronicles 7, he'd become king of Israel, succeeding his father, David. But it was a messy transition. Lots of bloodshed, uncertainty, bad family dynamics. But after turning to the Lord in repentance, Solomon asked for wisdom. And God brought a complete revival to Israel. It became like the very epicenter of a global wisdom movement. People from all around the known world flocked to the court of Solomon to see what God was doing. The Queen of Sheba we read about and lots of others. The Babylonians, uh, the Egyptians. And they nicked his stuff. If you were a civil servant in ancient Egypt, you were trained by this book they had called The Wisdom of Amenemope. It's lifted word but from, but and word from the stuff Solomon wrote, the book of Proverbs, the book of Ecclesiastes. They nicked God's manual because they saw the amazing wisdom in it. In other words, Israel rose to the top because the people had repented a turnaround. And accompanying this advancement of God's kingdom, we often see signs of the kingdom breaking into our city, breaking into our lives, a taste, a foretaste of what is to come. And one of those is healing. We heard Gabrielle saying about praying for her son and his knee. We had a similar thing recently at our church in KL. Uh, there's a family, actually they're neighbours of ours. Well, they, they were, they just moved recently, but they were neighbours of ours. The wife is from mainland China, and she came on Alpha. Absolutely loved it. So she started to bring along her son, who's uh, quite grown up, and the son had a major encounter of the Holy Spirit. And he said to mum, his mum, I want to get baptised. So February this year, I had the privilege of baptizing him. And the dad came along to the baptism service. The dad is actually English, which means he's a little bit more cynical. And, uh, but he's a great guy. He's called Norman. And because he's my neighbor, 
I know he was in a lot of pain. He uh, needed a complete knee replacement surgery. And that day, he was, the day of the baptism service, he was in a lot of pain. He couldn't even stand up. So he had to sit down throughout the whole service. And at the end of the uh, service, a few of us went up to him. I said, Norman, can we pray for you that God would heal and take away the pain in your knee? And amazingly, he said, why not? Yeah, thanks. So we, we laid a hand on Norman's knee and in the name of Jesus, commanded the pain to be gone. I said, Norman, receive your healing in Jesus' name. Amen. And he did that very English thing, which just, just went, thanks, mate. So then baptized his son, and that was on Sunday. Wednesday, knock on my front door, open it. It's Norman. Miles, can I come in? I said, yeah, sure, come in. And he goes, look, he said, I am a man of science. And he says, but I've got no explanation for this. He said, these last three days, no pain at all. He said, I don't know how, but Jesus has healed me. And then about a month and a half later, they were moving house. And I went uh, round the day that all the boxes were coming out to say goodbye to Norman and the family. And the new family was there who were about to move in. And Norman turns to the wife and says, oh, this is your neighbor, Miles. He runs a church. I went there and Jesus healed me. You should go. <laughs> I went, hi. And she's like, what? Oh, <laughs> but that's what we see. When we go from the when to the if to the then, we go through this process of humility, hunger, holiness, and healing. But all of this is not on account of us. We can do none of this in our own strength. It's all through the grace of God and the presence and power of his Holy Spirit. So if you wanted another H, that would be it. Holy Spirit. And actually, we read this in the passage. It says this in verse 16. The Lord says, I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. So God promises that his presence will always be in the temple. But as we know from the New Testament, the temple now is not buildings made of stone, but people. The temple made of living stones, you and me. Ephesians 2, 21. Paul writes that God's family is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So that promise to Solomon still stands. I will always be in this temple. But now it's worked out by his presence being in you and the person next to you and me and all of us. And we together like building blocks build the temple here on earth as his kingdom comes. That's why Jesus, the last thing he says to the disciples at the end of Matthew's gospel is, and I will be with you always until the very end of the age. And here in 2 Chronicles 7, he says of his temple, my eyes and my heart will always be there. You see, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's like God enables you to have his eyes. You begin to see the world as he sees it. You begin to see the people around you as he sees them, beautifully made in the image of God, of eternal and matchless worth. He gives you his eyes and he gives you his heart. His law no longer written on tablets of stone, but on our hearts. And you begin to feel for people and your neighbor and your city as he feels for it. That's what the Spirit does. And it changes 
everything. There can be no revival in our lives, in our families, our workplace, in our city, in our nation, unless we are first filled with the Spirit. And He's always with you, even when you don't feel like it. You know, about a month ago, uh, I went to Bangladesh to launch Alpha in the church church in Bangladesh. It's an amazing country, about 170 million people. Dakar, the capital, most crazy city on the planet, 20 million people. The traffic, oh my goodness, don't ask me about the traffic. But I landed in Dakar at 11.30 p.m. at night, and I get to the immigration desk with the immigration police, and I give them my passport. I think, okay, I've got everything I need for my visa. They look at it and go, hmm, cannot. We need additional documents. I don't know why they said this. But they said, we need additional documents for the organization that's invited you, which was the Baptist Union. And uh, they said, you have to get them to bring the documents, or else we can't, we can't let you in the country. Now, by this point, it's gone midnight, and all I had was the number of their office. This doesn't look good. So I phone up, and of course... Nobody answers the phone. It's gone midnight. I mean, who's in the, in the office? Gone midnight. So I said to the immigration policeman, I'm, you know, look, it's gone midnight. They're not in the office. This is everything the website said I needed. Can you let me in? He goes, no, 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 no. Unless they turn up with these extra documents, I can't let you in. I'm going to be honest with you. The low point was around 2.30 a.m., I'm sitting there in Dakar airport, completely empty, apart from me and two young Japanese tourists, also struggling. As far as I'm aware, they might still be there. And I started in my head to shout at God. I was like, God, why have you abandoned me? I'm doing you a favor being here, don't you know? Jesus, I prayed about this. Didn't you hear? Why have you left me here? Where are you, God? Then something amazing happened about 3 a.m. I tried that office number one more time. And to my amazement, a guy picks up the phone. Like, what is he doing in the office at 3 a.m. in the Baptist Union? He picks up the phone, and I explain my predicament. And he goes, oh, yeah, 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 it's not a problem. I can bring that over. You can? And he goes, but just, just let me speak to the guard. Okay. Hand over my phone. They start chatting. Now, it transpires that this guy who picked up the phone used to be a teacher. And decades before they work out, when he was a boy, he used to teach the immigration guard. <laughs> and then the immigration guard is really surprised and interested to find out, this guy, he's no longer a teacher, he's now a pastor. And then he starts telling the guard all about Jesus. And then the most surprising thing happens. The guard looks at me whilst he's still on the phone and he goes, will you pray for me? And I'm like, what now? <laughs> and he goes, yeah. So I'm like, okay. So there and then about 3.15 a.m. in the middle of Dakar airport, with prayers coming down the phone, I lean over the desk and I lay my hand on the immigration guard. I say, well, do you know what? We might as well go for it. So I say to the Japanese tourists, come on. <laughs> and they're like, oh, what do we do? I said, just stretch out a hand. So they stretch out. <laughs> and we start a prayer meeting in Dakar International Airport. And we pray for this guy. Ah, 
And the Holy Spirit really came. And he starts. <laughs> it was unbelievable. And then after that, he's like, <laughs> he says, thank you. Here's your visa. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know what I realized? As I was walking out, I was like, oh my goodness. God, you were in this all along, weren't you? <laughs> you were here all along. You hadn't abandoned anyone. You just needed me to just wait a little bit because you knew that random guy had to pick up the phone at 3 a.m. in the morning in the office to speak to this guy who he taught when he was a little boy so he could now tell him he was a pastor and share the gospel with him and then we could have a prayer meeting with Japanese tourists in the middle of the air. I was like, oh my goodness. Jesus, you didn't lie. I am with you always even to the very end of the airport. <laughs> Shall we pray? Do you know what? Before we pray, come Holy Spirit. Maybe we could sort of wrap up a little bit of what we've been talking about. You know, just before the people of God cross over the River Jordan into the Promised Land. And in the Old Testament, what is spoken of, of the land is so often in the New Testament fulfilled by the person of Jesus. Just before they cross over the Jordan into the presence of the land, Joshua, their leader, uh, goes amongst the people. And you'll know this. He says in uh, Joshua 3, 5, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. And to consecrate means to dedicate yourself. It means to turn to God, say sorry, and then commit yourself to him. Say, I'm all in, God. 100%. I'm yours and I'm all in. So I wonder whether we could do that now. And the, the way we're going to do that is we're just going to take a moment in a minute of silence. You can just remain seated. And if there's anything that you want to say to the Lord, maybe you need to say sorry. This is a, a really amazing moment of repentance and receiving his forgiveness. Maybe you need to be set free from something. Maybe you, your prayer is, Lord, I'm a little bit hungry. Would you make me more hungry? But it's a, or you just say, Lord, from today onwards, I'm not holding back. I'm consecrating myself. I'm all in 100%. But, so we're just going to remain seated. And this is between you and the Lord. A very special moment, a holy moment. Because I believe tomorrow he's going to do amazing things amongst you in this church. And then when you're ready, when you've done your business with the Lord, then feel free to just stand whenever you're done. And then one by one we'll stand. But let's take this moment to talk with your maker.
There's no rush whenever you're ready, but we're just going to ask the Holy Spirit to come right now. So we invite you, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Would you fill us again now with your presence, with your love. Just receive the presence of God afresh. <laughs> 